Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Kansas City Public Library. We are, thank you. Uh, we are uh, once again uh, very, very pleased uh, to uh, to be presenting David Von Drilly, uh Dateline Washington uh, in association with our uh, our partners, uh, the Truman uh, Presidential Library. Um, also, uh, courtesy of uh, our ongoing sponsor, uh, the Ewing uh, Marion Kaufman uh, Foundation. Uh, so we're grateful for that. I'll mention a couple of upcoming programs. Uh, uh, politics being a theme uh, tonight, uh, you'll all want to come to the next in our Hail to the Chiefs series, which is also a series we're doing with the, uh, the Truman Library and the Truman Library Institute. Uh, and our, our next presentation is on Woodrow Wilson. There is a new biography of Wilson by the Pulitzer Prize winning, really wonderful biographer, uh, Scott Berg. Uh, and so I want to mention that. That's uh, Thursday, October 3rd. Uh, and uh, uh, that'll be, I think, at the Plaza Library, I believe. Um, and uh, uh, one thing I will also mention is later in October, I don't remember the exact date, uh, we have a return engagement from the uh, a great American historian, Harvard historian, Jill Lepore. And if you, if you want to see an intersection of our, our speakers, read, I think it's in last week's New Yorker, it might be two weeks ago, uh, Jill Lepore's review of Scott Berg's uh, uh, Wilson. Um, anyway, th 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 that, that is upcoming. And then uh, uh, one other thing uh, that I want to mention that's, uh, that's coming up uh, is uh, uh, those of you who are fans of Downton Abbey, uh, we have uh, Gail McCall Jarrett, uh, the author of To Marry an English Lord, which is one of, one of the books that for which, which is a basis for uh, uh, Downton Abbey, will be here on, uh, at also at the Plaza on September uh, 26th. Uh, so bring your tea caddies and uh, your butlers. Anyway, tonight we are continuing with our great series with uh, David Von Drilly, uh, uh, that we're calling Dateline Washington, where he interviews uh, the greats uh, of the Beltway uh, media establishment, though you're going to get a sort of anti-establishment uh, view, I think, uh, tonight. David, of course, you, you, you all uh, who have been here before will, will know the, uh, the saga of David uh, uh, and his uh, wife, Karen. Uh, she was the uh, uh, New York. Let's see. The, she was the New York Daily News. Washington. No, I get this backwards. She was the Washington Post, New York correspondent. New York Daily News, the New York Washington, Daily News Washington, Washington correspondent, and David uh, was the Washington Post New York correspondent. Um, <laughs> and they got together. They had four children, and they realized uh, that after having four children, uh, having you know, they they'd worked in their offices as all journalists do, sleeping on couches, that their combined salaries would not buy a studio apartment in Washington, D.C. <laughs> <clears throat> and so they took the wagon train out to Kansas City, uh, stopped in Overland Park, where their combined salaries as, uh, as journalists today uh, will get them a garden apartment, studio apartment in Overland Park. <laughs> I just threw the garden in to make you, so you wouldn't feel badly for them. Uh, but uh, D David is, is, of course, one of the, one of the great journalists in uh, America today. He was Denver's youngest sports writer. Uh, he went to the Miami Herald, where, where he won the Livingston Award, one of the m most important awards in journalism, the American Bar Association Silver Ga Gavel Award, uh, a, a, a vast trophy uh, 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 set of trophies that, he, that he's got, and, and then became the New York bureau chief for the Washington Post. We also know him as a great author. He's written a triangle about the triangle Angle Fire, one of the great disasters, and it's one of the great books on disasters. It's not a disastrous book at all, though. I just want to make that clear. And uh, and he was here with with his his book on Abraham Lincoln, uh, the Emancipation Proclamation, the year 1862, uh, Rise to Greatness, which is I itself a a great book. So we're, it's it's wonderful to have David here, and as his uh, 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 interlocutor in this conversation, we have uh, one of my heroes, uh, Megan uh, McCardle. Uh, Megan. I've met Megan uh, twice before, which I, I don't think she remembers either time, but the first time uh, was uh, w w a, some kind of conference. I'm sure the Koch brothers sponsored it because we need to inject conspiracy theory in this uh, event. And uh, it was in California. It was under a tent. Arnold Schwarzenegger was also there. And of course, my eyes were blinded by his star power. Um, I was walking behind him to, to lunch. He fell backwards. I held him up. I, I don't know if I did a good thing for the nation in California or not. Um, but I know we then went and sat down and with, with Megan McArdle, and, and, and I can tell you that Arnold Schwarzenegger's star power disappeared for me at that, at that moment. I found out that Megan was 
was Jane Galt. Uh, those of you who know about blogging will know that uh, blogging is, is, is a, a recent phenomenon. And it was essentially, economics blogging was essentially invented by Megan McArdle as, as Jane Galt. I mean, originally she didn't have a real job and she was working at the World Trade Center and she, and, and she started a blog uh, and it's gone on uh, from there to, uh, uh, she's, she's done this for the Atlantic, she's done this uh, for the Daily Beast, she's now doing it for Bloomberg View. Uh, and uh, uh, she, she is an, an extraordinary, uh, wonderful writer, um, and uh, she says about herself in, in, a, in a recent column uh, blog, if I get interested in an idea, I start talking, and if I think someone's wrong, I'll tell them they're wrong. As I've gotten older, I've gotten more tactful about it. Well, I'm not entirely sure about that last statement. <laughs> Because in another recent uh, uh, blog, she talks about this is th these are both really that one was from her her uh, blog on uh, Harvard and gender. You might have seen the article in the New York Times. She takes it apart. Um, but uh, there's another one uh, about uh, healthcare and about how the reason we saved the Germans and the Japanese after World War II is is revealed in this column. Uh, the, Healthcare costs. She's talking about what they're doing in Germany and Japan to solve the problem of uh, how expensive it is to maintain your parents in their older years. Um, so I'm sure we're all concerned with that. Uh, the solution that many Germans, I quote Megan, have hit on is to export their parents to nursing homes in Eastern Europe, where lower wages allow a better standard of care at a lower cost. Relocating populations, large populations having worked so well for the Germans in the past. <laughs> But here's my favorite line. The, 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 the Japanese, of course, are more concentrated on a technological solution, so they've got robots that are taking care uh, of, uh, uh, of older people. And she points out that it takes, uh, you have to have a robot that's 10 times the size uh, of the object it's lifting in order for it to lift the object. Um, and she says, how will a patient with dementia react when a giant machine grabs her and tries to brush her teeth? That's how I lost two of my ex-wives. But uh, <laughs> anyway, ladies and gentlemen, David Vondrilli and Megan McArdle. The secret to good journalism, always be late. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming out tonight. Uh, thank you, as always, to Crosby for his entertaining uh, introductions. My uh, arrival here in Kansas City gets more interesting every time he tells it, <laughs> at least uh, more interesting to me. Thank you to the Kansas City Public Library, Henry Fortunato, uh, to the uh, Truman Library Institute, and to the Kaufman Foundation for making this possible. Um, I will tell you that uh, one secret of this series of conversations is that it's an excuse for me to get my friends to Kansas City. Uh, this is the one in the series of six where I did not know my uh, guest uh, before meeting her today. And she's here because I have been a huge fan for years uh, reading her uh, economics blog as it's moved across uh, the digital space. I admire Megan very much uh, for the, the fact that unlike so many of us in journalism, she thinks for herself. Uh, she uh, actually knows things about the world and when she doesn't know things, she reports them out, tries to find people who do know about them. Uh, in order to answer questions. She's a genuine reporter, uh, bringing, in, in my view, the best qualities of journalism to uh, this n newer, not new anymore, but newer format of uh, blogging. And I'm delighted to have her in Kansas City and talk to her about a subject that matters to all of us, the economy. Um, when we scheduled this, I didn't realize that it would come uh, five years after the uh, uh, collapse of Lehman Brothers and the uh, roller coaster that that set off. And maybe roller coaster is the wrong image. And maybe it's just straight down from there. I think they um, used to call that a shoot the shoot. <laughs> shoot the shoot. Straight down. <laughs> uh, 
Um, but uh, five years in, uh, according to the Congressional Budget Office today, uh, their latest forecast, uh, deficits having gone uh, up to near record levels uh, in relation to GDP are now down again to historically uh, precedented levels, let's put it that <laughs> way, about 4% of GDP. Our debt remains very high, 73% of GDP, which matches only uh, a brief period around World War II. Uh, according to the Census Bureau today, median income of non-elderly households is down 11.6% for the period 2000 to 2012. So we are clearly not to the end of this uh, dramatic economic story that we're living through. I wonder if you'd talk to us uh, a little bit about the ideas that are fascinating you at the moment, uh, because when we talked at lunch, you're forward-looking more than backward-looking. You're, you're analyzing what's to come as opposed to retelling the story of, of, the, of the past. Well, um, like everyone else, I'm spending a lot of time thinking about the economy and the ways in which uh, the last five years have radically changed my assessment of how things work. If you had asked me in 2008 whether we could have another Great Depression-like event, it didn't come to, thank, thankfully, did not come to the level of the Great Depression, I would have said, no, of course not. We've got all these incredibly smart regulators. I had interviewed many of these regulators. They told me how smart they were. Um, <laughs> But you know, really, you would, you would, I remember talking to a credit analyst in 2006, and I really think this, this captured everything that was going on at the time, and he worked for a, a major bank, and he did uh, emerging market credit. And he said to me, well, you know, the great thing is that we've gotten so much better at pricing credit risk that we can go out and do these deals that we couldn't have done 10 years ago. And um, I wasn't really actually sure whether we were on an interview or a date, so I was <laughs> probing quite <laughs> uh, carefully. <laughs> And um, I said, well, have we actually gotten better or do we just think we've gotten better? And I don't want to take any credit for particular prescience. I'm just sort of a natural naysayer. Um, but he said, oh, no, no, we've really gotten better. So this guy is, as you might expect, no longer working in finance along with <laughs> a lot of other people. But it wasn't just him. Right. It was the right. regulators all thought that they'd gotten smarter. Everyone thought that these things couldn't happen. And so um, you know, I think that ty economist Tyler Cowen says we are not as, as it fundamentally sums up the crisis this way, we are not as rich as we thought we were. And I think that that it actually was, that it revealed all of these things that we had, we just, we had borrowed against the future because we thought the future was brighter than it was. And so now we're retrenching and it's that there, inequality didn't bother me five years, six years ago in the way that it does now because it didn't seem as intractable as it did. And all of these problems, long-term unemployment was not a problem. Um, we are entering a phase in which America's, Americans are going to be struggling a lot more, and that struggle has been happening at the bottom for a long time. But it's now happening in the middle, and we have enormous challenges in, in getting back to a place where it's not quite as big a struggle as, as it is right now for a lot of families. You, uh, in fact, have a book coming yes. out uh, in February where you're going to unfold some of these ideas, and we'll talk... Uh, We'll talk more about that, but you're known on uh, on the internet uh, to, to, as a slippery character <laughs> to pin down uh, uh, the your original blogging identity. Jane Galt suggests a strong libertarian streak. Do, are you an actual reader of Ayn Rand? Uh, I am, although not. I was never an objectivist. I mean, this, this name was actually quite silly. I picked it in order to anger someone in the New York Times forums in 1996 <laughs> uh, who was calling everyone who disagreed with him and was like to the right of Chairman Mao. He would call them, I'm not making this up, there would be social democrats who would say, well, maybe we shouldn't actually nationalize the coal mines. And he would say, you ran droid fool. Um, <laughs> and so I wanted to respond to something he said, and I picked this name, and it became my email address because no one had it, and it was all very childish at the time. Uh, I do, actually, and I think that Ayn Rand had actually quite a few gifts as uh, an observer of how markets and industries work. Um, I, I think she's 
less apt describer of how human relationships work. <laughs> Um, but uh, I'm not an objectivist per se, which disappoints a lot of objectivists who, uh, who meet me. That's right. And um, you, uh, when we hear a, a blogger um, go quickly to the inequality and uh, long-term unemployment, these are the problems of the future, there is a, a tendency for us to immediately try to slot you in then as, well, you must be some sort of big government liberal, a right. redistributionist, but. I, you know, I look at this, I, I do, you know, as I say, I'm a moderate libertarian. My husband works for a libertarian magazine and every time one of the commenters wants to insult him, they start off by saying, calling him Mr. McArdle. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I actually, I think that inequality is a problem and, and for example, in the case of people who are severely disabled, or, you know, I, I think that there, there's a, a role for the kind of strong re redistribution that a big government liberal would call for. Um, if you are handicapped and can't work, I think that the government should take care of you. Um, but I actually think it's, in a way, it's just not enough. I mean, even if you want to do redistribution, you look at people, you look at people on, on social security disability and it's not a happy life. And it's not just because the benefit's low, because the benefit's not that much lower than it would be in, in another country. What they don't have is a job. What they don't have is engagement with the rest of society. They don't have a feeling of creating something and contributing. And we can laugh about McJobs, but you know, my grandfather owned a gas station and he pumped gas for a considerable portion of his life for 68 years and went there even after he sold it. He was still working for free. That having a place to go and having a place where you're needed, even if it's not a particularly fabulous job, it engages you with the rest of the community. And when you look at, it's really interesting, there's psychological research on what happens to you after a bad event. And I talk about this a little bit in the book. Um, so for example, the things you would expect, if you get divorced, you get sad. If you get married, you get happy. But over time, you actually acclimate. It's actually a little distressing. Widows are actually happier five years later. Um, <laughs> um, uh, that's no surprise to my wife, I'm sure. Um, but here is the one thing people do not acclimate to, no matter how long it goes on. They do not acclimate to being unemployed. If they are unemployed five years later, they are pretty much just as unhappy as they were when they lost their job. And so to say, oh, we're gonna just take it off the top and redistribute, it actually doesn't fix the fundamental problems. It's not just employment, it's also things like marriage. Educated people are having what uh, Harvard researcher Catherine Eden calls super relationships. They're these incredibly engaged, satisfying marriages, very low divorce rates now. May surprise you, educated people are now less likely to divorce than any other group. Um, they have very satisfying marriages that offer them an enormous amount. People who don't go to college, um, they tend to get married after they've had their first kid. They live in fragile, unstable relationships. And this has all sorts of impacts on your earning power, right? It's hard to, it's hard to invest in your career if you're raising two kids on your own and the father's not contributing. Or if you've got three child support payments to make, as many you know, low-income men now do. That in fact, America is pulling apart in all sorts of ways. And th those things, family and, and employment, actually matter more than whether you're getting a top up in your paycheck from a housing subsidy. So economics, to the extent I understand it, which is very little. Um, <laughs> Don't uh, worry, economists feel the same way. <laughs> <laughs> I do think, I will, I will interject that every year when they give the Nobel Prize uh, for economics, I, I, I remind myself that it is not given by the actual Nobel Prize committee, that it's a bank in, in Sweden. And I've always felt that anything that, if you can give the prize to Milton Friedman and Paul Krugman, it can't be called a science, right? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure it could be called an art either. I'm really not sure where it goes. Uh, but it, one thing that it does, that economists that I read do seem to agree on is that money creates incentives and that, uh, uh, the, so talk a little bit about the role then of money, how we move it around in attacking such intractable problems as you're laying out because you, uh, that's, that's where you come from is, 
Well, this actually is, I mean, this is, these are the hard problems, right? We've solved the easy problems. Problems that get solved merely by t writing a check to someone, we've fixed, we've basically fixed most of those problems. Um, what we're left with are the really difficult problems. And there are some things on the margin that you can look at. So, um, you know, when you talk to sociologists about what's happening um, to marriage, for example, I think all of the good ones basically agree that it's a combination of not having well-paying and importantly stable jobs. So it's not just the paycheck. My grandfather worked as a grocery boy during the Great Depression and supported a wife on that salary. Not easily and not because they paid grocery boys a lot during the Great Depression. Um, but there was, it was in a small farm community and there was a sense of this job would go on as long as um, he needed it. There was also a sense of if it didn't, there was the farm to fall back on. There was a sort of sense of, of a bottom level of, of a net below which you couldn't fall that was part of the fabric of the community, not a government program. Um, so that's part of it, but there also is a cultural part. And you know, here's the thing, they moved in with his parents, they literally cut a hole in the wall, ran their stovepipe through so that they didn't um, have to share a kitchen because I believe it's actually true that uh, the Chinese character for trouble is two women in one house. Um, <laughs> So my, my grandmother did not have to try to share a kitchen with her mother-in-law. They had like a bed. And that's a level that most people, when you talk to people at the bottom, in fact, in part, I, I, I kind of blame television. It's the level of, you know, what's that show? Say yes to the dress, right? You're supposed to have this amazing extravaganza wedding, and then you're supposed to have, be able to buy a house. All of those things that people did after 20 years and the Great Depression are now expected to be, they think of those as the baseline. And the tragedy is that for them, that baseline seems so far away that why would you, why would you wait? It's like t saying to someone, um, well, you should wait to, to have a kid until you've won the Nobel Prize in economics. And then, you know, it just right. doesn't seem realistic to them. Right, it, which gets back to the, the, the quote from Tyler Cowen that you gave us of, we're not as rich as we thought we were. That was, that same realization hit me as I was trying to write stories for time about the ongoing collapse, that really this basic problem is that uh, we don't have as much money as we thought we did. And so we're going to have to, at some level, get accustomed to being poorer. Uh, but that doesn't seem to match the, uh, the, the other side of the coin that I'm hearing, which is that the way to get the economy clicking over again is to stimulate consumer debt. Uh, get people feeling confident enough to go out and borrow money for, uh, well, I was in Costco last week and <laughs> I can tell you they're up to the 80 inch flat screen. And I'm, my 60 inch is looking really small to me right now. <laughs> and uh, how, do we, how, do we square, how do we square that? Well, I think there's there's actually this interesting thing of in a lot of ways, right? You know, the television that I own is a mere fifty inch, so I really no, <laughs> I sort of want to slink off stage <laughs> no, now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but you know, those things are getting are cheap. They're getting cheaper all the time. Um, and in fact, a lot of the things houses haven't gone away, right? All the houses we built during the housing bubble are still there, and someone is living in them. So, or in most cases, I think some exurban McMansions are sort of rotting. But in most cases, you know, the wealth that we thought we had is still there. What isn't there is the sense that it's going to increase. What isn't there is the sense that every year there's another 3% coming on top of my paycheck. Um, and here's the thing. I, you know, I don't want to oversell this because obviously, like, I have a great job in a declining industry to be sure, but <laughs> it's still a great job. Um, and but the fact is that Americans are the best off of basically any people in history. I mean, we can argue about whether Denmark's really better off, but in general, you know, if you're born in this country now with antibiotics and dentistry and all this, like you hit the lottery yes. flat out. You are not having to spend 12 hours a day trying to make a sweet potato grow so that you can eat it or picking <laughs> bug larva, I'm not making this up, hunter gatherers, surprising amount of bugs. Anyone on the paleo diet? You should be eating more bugs because, <laughs> um, so you know, we're not picking bug larva off of trees for four hours a day so that we'll have bug larva to eat for dinner. Um, you know, we really are doing surprisingly well. What we kind of have to ask ourselves is, is there an economics 
and a sense of personal well-being that does not come from our salary going up every year. And I'm not saying that we're doomed to ne never happening, but if for 20 years the economy just kind of goes along like that, which is basically what's happened to Japan, is there a social cohesion, a sense of personal well-being that we can derive from saying, you know what, we've got it great. It could be better, but we've got it pretty good and focusing on that and focusing on, honestly, it, it really is true. When you look at the sources of happiness, job being employed is really happy. Um, and having personal autonomy in your job is great, but you know what really comes down to? It's friends, family, and relationships. Those are the things that make you the happiest in your life. Um, how do we, re and, and you can argue, I think a lot of social conservatives certainly do, and more than a few leftists do, that over the last 30 years, the kind of hyper-professionalism of the American economy has drawn certainly the educated class away from that, and maybe it's time to, to look towards that a little bit and a little less towards whether we can have the 80-inch flat screen. Now I'm sounding like a socialist. Yeah, wow. <laughs> <laughs> um, your book is called The Upside of Down. It is. And it, it, it talks about uh, the American genius for failure. If I can put words into your mouth. Yes. Uh, uh, by the way, it makes a great gift. Also, if you have any uh, <laughs> tables that are shaky and need propping up, just one on each corner of the table <laughs> leg. Yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your thesis. And uh, because we're, of course, raised to believe that the American story is about success. But it is. But it's about succeeding through failure, which, in fact, is the way most of us do succeed, right? We, we read all these stories, and it's always about the, you know, Colonel Sanders standing astride his uh, his fried chicken empire, for example. Well, you know how how Kentucky Fried Chicken got uh, founded? No kidding. He was 65 years old. He owned a truck stop, and the state of Kentucky built a highway that took all the traffic from his truck stop. So he was bankrupt. Basically, he had to close the place. Um, and 65 it, years at the age old. of 65. I love this story because I get so many people running into me right now saying, I've lost my job, I'm 50, it's all over. I've just given up. And it's like, no, you know, uh, Julia Child, 51 years old, wrote Mastering the Art of French Cooking. It was never time to give up. But Harlan Sanders, yeah, he, and he was a guy who didn't even really get going until he was 40. His wife at one point left him because she was so sick of him not having, like getting fired for talking back to his boss or just not getting along with people. But at 40, he founded a truck stop. It went pretty well for 25 years. And then it went bankrupt. And so he went on the road, and he took his recipe for fried chicken that he'd been serving and a pressure cooker, and he started cooking it for people in restaurants. And he got a guy in Utah, was his first customer, ran a cafe, and said, OK, I'll pay you five cents a chicken uh, for the recipe. And the guy, when they're painting the window, said, well, what are we going to call it? You know, we're painting something on the window to announce the new chicken dish. Said, it's from Kentucky, Kentucky Fried Chicken. Um, and that is history, that he was the guy who eventually founded the franchise, and Harlan Sanders died pretty wealthy because of it. Um, but this is, I mean, this goes way back. The Pilgrims, failures. Most of the founding fathers, Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, totally bankrupt. Um, and when he died at the time of his death, the United States public was taking up newspaper subscriptions. The newspapers were trumpeting raise money for Thomas Jefferson because he's about to lose his house. Um, you know, which is why the United States Constitution has a bankruptcy clause in it. We suspect because many of the founding fathers were in need of it. Um, <laughs> we are the people who came over here because things weren't going so well in the old country. There were a lot of people fleeing debts. There were a lot of people fleeing creditors, their suitors, <laughs> people who were mad at them, the law. Um, we, did, we did not quite as much as Australia, but we had a little bit of a business as a prison colony. And we took those people and gave them a second chance. And they became, or their descendants, became the titans of, of um, America and built the richest big country and the biggest rich country on Earth. And I think that actually the reason that we did this really is that Americans, more than almost anywhere else, we like that guy who tried and failed. Right, we like a story. Donald Trump, how many banks have given this guy money? He goes bankrupt like every five years and they just keep giving him money. Um, but you know, our bankruptcy code reflects this. Um, all sorts of things reflect this. In Europe, if you are running a, comp a company and it goes bankrupt, that's pretty much it for you as an executive. 
I mean, they won't let you starve, but they're not gonna let you run another company. In the United States, if you do this, and you go to Silicon Valley, they're like, great, I've got, I bet you've got a lot of good experience. Um, <laughs> but this is actually true. Think of your own life. Think of like the biggest things that you've learned from. It is not the time you finally climbed up to the top. It's all the stuff you did wrong along the way, right? That is how successful businesses and lives are founded, one mistake at a time. And it is painful. I'm not actually downselling this. It's terrible, right? No one likes failing. That's because it's nature's way of telling you don't do it. If you liked it, it wouldn't work. <laughs> um, but it's incredibly successful. And the reason that America is so good at it is that it is a nation that is literally founded by people who came here to get away from something that was not working somewhere else. But one of the things you said to me at lunch that I found so fascinating was, and so provocative, was that you're concerned that we're not as good at failure as we used to be. Talk a little bit about that. I am concerned about it. Um, I think you see this in a variety of different ways. I think you see it in, for example, the bankruptcy code. Uh, I talked a little bit about this. And you wouldn't think bankruptcy would be such an important topic, but it really is. And so in the book, I interview a guy who's a Danish small businessman whose business um, he basically had to shut down and just go back to being a sole proprietor and fire his employees. And in America, that would be sad, but in, De in Denmark, it was catastrophic because he had to pay all these severance payments for his employees. He ended up with this huge debt, and he struggled with that debt. He's now been struggling with it for 10 years, basically since 9-11 since happened and the, and the recession that followed. Um, and actually, when you look at America, we have this neat little natural, natural experiment because the bankruptcy code is federal, but the exemptions are set at the state level. So how much of your home equity you can keep, whether you know a television, your workman's tools, this is all set at the state level. And you can see that um, states that are more generous have higher levels of entrepreneurship. Why? Because it's a lot easier to start a business if you are not worried that you're gonna be out on the street and have lost your house if it doesn't go well. Um, in 2005, though, we looked at this and said, we need to reform it. And my basic, I reported on this at the time, is actually part of the genesis of the book, because I looked at this and said, you know, the problem that excessively loose bankruptcy should create is that it will be hard to borrow money, right? I mean, does anyone in the room think that that was a problem in 2005, we just couldn't borrow enough money, <laughs> right? Um, we, were, we were fixing a problem we didn't have and creating a problem where we hadn't had one. We had had, we have the most generous bankruptcy code in the world by far. Chapter seven doesn't even exist anywhere else. I remember trying to describe our bankruptcy code and the draconian new law, because that was what the consumer advocates were calling it, to my colleagues at The Economist, and I was describing the new law, and they were like, well, but if you can just walk into a judge and say, I'm sorry, I can't pay, and that's it? Of course you have to reform that. And I was like, no, 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 this is the draconian new law. <laughs> um, the old one was even, even more generous. We are fantastically generous with bankruptcy, um, and it actually helps all of us. You know, getting that last inch out of someone, what it does, as with my, my Danish uh, entrepreneur, is it just ties them to this old debt. They can't move on. It's hard for them. The bank gets a little bit more out of it, but they have to spend a lot of time going after him for it. And what you've done is you, you've created dead capital. You took a human being who had potential to move on and do something else and take the information that he learned by failing and do something else with it, and now you've just shackled him to this old debt so that he can't really move. Um, so I think we've, we've done badly that way. Um, I think that the educational system, you know, America's always had very good reentry into the educational system. Yeah, well, you didn't do so well in high school, take a year off, go to community college, and fix it. The price of education is getting so high that it's getting much harder to do that. It's getting much harder to recover, especially a, at the elite levels where you have, I mean, it's like being groomed to go to Versailles, right? You, you start off, in, I'm not making this up, a trader of my acquaintance, uh, in New York was being interviewed for his daughter's preschool. Mm -hmm. And they said, what are her aspirations? <laughs> <laughs> and this is a guy from Long Island who's, you know, got his start on the train. He's like, I want her to not eat paste. <laughs> like, um, but they're, they're totally serious because you have to get into a good preschool. If you don't get into a pre good preschool, you're pretty much done for a good kindergarten. And then if you don't get into a good kindergarten, how are you going to get into an excellent grammar school program, right. which right. is really going to set you on the road to a good high school? Right. I mean, it's just totally, and I, I actually went through the system because I grew up in Manhattan, but it wasn't like that when I was growing up. It was sort of mattered where you went to high school, um, but you could, 
you know, I, I went, no one thought you weren't going to go to college they or were, that if you didn't, it was going to be some sort of incredible catastrophe that would just ruin your life. They were just starting that when we began to have kids in Washington, D.C. And we went, uh, my older colleagues at the Washington Post said, oh, well, Henry has to go to preschool at this one particular preschool and just go over, tell them they work at the Post. They love people from the Post who get in. Uh, it'll be no problem. So we went over for our tour and our interview and discovered it had gotten much more difficult. And we got to the end of the tour and the admissions person sat down with us and said, well, now it's very difficult to get in here. Uh, we have a lot of legacies, you know, meaning younger <laughs> siblings of, uh, or children of former preschools. This is a preschool, I want to remind you. And, Ultimately, they came around and said, we really only take about one new student a year. <laughs> and I looked across the table at the other husband and wife who were touring and recognized then Ambassador, uh, uh, Undersecretary of State for Africa, now National Security Advisor, Susan Rice. <laughs> And I whispered to my wife, it's not going to be us. <laughs> well, and the irony of this, right, is that you actually, you, you're, there's this huge failure point right at 18 where suddenly your life, every, this is a referendum on your whole life. I mean, I was, you know, I wrote essays for college, but I actually wrote an essay for Penn and was admitted that started when I was eight, I decided I wanted to be Amish. And I actually managed to sell myself at the University of Pennsylvania. It was a low populated birth, you know, I was born in like a, a birth trow. So. Um, but, you know, here's the thing is that because the stakes are so high, so they now, there is now a problem in the New York City uh, private school system, which is tutors who do the children's work for them. And the schools, you know, administrators will kind of admit that this is a thing, but they will never admit it on the record. Um, and so the, they send notes home to the parents saying, please do not hire tutors who do your children's work for them. It's sort of counterproductive. And then the parents nod and keep hiring the tutors who do their kids' work <laughs> for them. And this is crazy, right? There, is that, did anyone read about the Harvard cheating scandal? Mm -hmm. This was amazing to me. And I know I'm elderly now, so it's really like I felt so crotchety with all the 20-year-olds <laughs> on Twitter because these 125 kids in a government class are taking an exam. And they're told it's an open book test and open notes, but you cannot discuss this with anyone else. So naturally, they start emailing each other. Um, and when they are caught, defend themselves on the grounds that uh, some of the concepts weren't clear. Uh, the questions weren't clear, and they, they didn't think some of the concepts had been covered in class. And all the 20-year-olds in my Twitter feed seemed to think this was entirely reasonable. And I was like, well, if, if 125 Harvard students cannot be relied on to know the meaning of the words do not discuss with anyone else, then <laughs> what is the hope for the rest of the population? And, but this is really, the stakes are so high that I think cheating has become a thing. You, you'd like to give your kids good values about that sort of thing, but if it's a choice between good values and them going to some third-rate college you've never heard of, well then, they'll, they'll have to acquire the values at some other time in some other way, right. because this is really important. And, and so, ironically, these kids actually go through the first 18 years of their life never having failed because it's too, it's too desperate if your child gets an F. I mean, my mother, I ha actually had a teacher who quite unfairly tried to torpedo. <laughs> uh, she really didn't like me, and she had done this to other students before, so I know it was, this is not just my paranoia. Um, but she actually tried to, in a Byzantine fashion that I will not bore the hell out of you with, uh, tried to torpedo my first semester of senior year grades. And my mother was just like, it's your job to learn how to get along with adults. And right. finally, an administrator intervened but, um, because she'd done this to people before. But here's the thing is that my parents could say that because my parents didn't think that the greatest tragedy in life was having to go to community college and then maybe transfer to a state school. But now that is the perception among people who live in Washington and New York and an increasing number of cities. That, that, that you absolutely must force your child through this system, and so you can't afford to let them fail in anything. You have to hire tutors, you have to, um, anything that you can do to give them an edge. And I think it's actually tremendously destructive, because these kids get out, and you hear this from business leaders, and I used to just think this was a bunch of geezers complaining about how much better we were at their age. 
Um, but I'm hearing it from people who've managed now generations of people coming in the workforce, and they say they're completely unable to work with that direction. They require this incredibly specific feedback, and I have to pat them on the head every five minutes and be like, that's fantastic, and it's just like it's in school. And why are so many kids going into to consulting and finance? I think in a lot of ways because it replicates what school is like. You're around a lot of people your own age. There's one person at the head of the group. You're given very specific tasks. You get graded frequently. And there's an up or out system that lets you know exactly where you stand. Let's do a little uh, part of economics is forecasting. It sounded like you're forecasting uh, a long period of low, slow growth or what's the chance that we'll be back in recession? What's the chance that we'll see uh, the economy continue to pick up? I'm always, when I'm asked these questions, put in mind of a uh, professor of mine who I watched being asked where the market would go. And he said, well, it'll go up, or it'll go down, <laughs> or it might go about the same. Um, and I think that I can't tell whether there's going to be another recession. Um, I, can't, you know, I can't say whether. I actually think the energy boom between the energy boom and the fact that, believe it or not, we actually handled the crisis better than basically anyone else, uh, whatever you think of what we did, um, certainly better than having a joint currency, which you then won't commit to, so that everyone just spends eight years trying to figure out whether Euro is going to stay alive or not. Um, we're actually in a better position than basically any other country in the, in the world, uh, any rich country, in part, um, except Norway, but they have a lot of oil. Um, and not many people. And not many people. But in part because our demographics are actually better. Our birth rates are higher, which means that our workforce is younger and it's growing. Um, and in places like Japan, it's not. I mean, it's shrinking. It's not a joke about the robots. They're really trying to build robots to take care of old people because they're fantastically against immigration and they have no idea who is going to care for the group of seniors, which will soon be larger than the group of people under 40. Um, so we're in better shape. But you know, do you really want to be like the best C student in the class? <laughs> um, I think that we're frail in a lot of ways. Demographically, we're frail. We are aging. And that has all sorts of implications because we didn't prepare for it as well as we should have. Um, and more generally, you know, I do think, and, and I would have killed anyone who said this six years ago, I'd have laughed them out of the room. But I think that technology is, is changing jobs at the bottom so fast. And it's automating a lot of middle management tasks. It's, mm -hmm. it, that, that it's a frightening time to be a worker now. Yes. Because you just don't know. No one knows whether their business is going to be. A, look at, you look at places like even tech, right? Groupon and Zynga. I mean, these were companies that had huge IPOs and then just sank like a rock. It's incredibly hard to predict where you're going to be in five years. And that's frightening for a lot of people. People really value stability. I don't think that we're going to have that. Um, to some extent, no one ever did. I mean, right. you know, Colonel Sanders in 1955, the same thing happened to my grandfather in 1955. He had a booming business on the main highway, and then they built another highway that was bigger. Um, and he had to really rethink his business. And certainly, women and African Americans and Mexicans and Indians, they, none of them participated in all these great union jobs that paid a zillion dollars forever and you didn't have to do much except like breathe and carry a tool bag. Um, those jobs were actually union, you know, the, the percentage of the population that was, for example, covered by a defined benefit population peaked at one third. It was never that high. The percentage of the population that was in a union job also peaked around one third in 1950. It was never that high. We've gilded the memory of how wonderful everything was. I saw today a BuzzFeed uh, meme, internet meme generator about, uh, I guess it was like 1980s guy, the baby boomer who ruined everything for the millennials. <laughs> and I've been feeling really bad for the millennials. This meme almost made me stop. Because, of course, it's a picture of a guy from, like, 1982. And I, anyone who was alive in 1982 knows this was not, like, a great time to graduate from college and, right. and get a wonderful job, right? Things have been hard all over before. But I do think that, you know, there is that said. It is more insecure than it was 10 years ago. It is more insecure, than it, certainly, than it was 40 years ago. And that, that's frightening for a lot of people, and we're going to have to adjust to that. That's the new normal. Uh, I agree with that, uh, the, the new normal. But if we can't forecast five years, how about a month? In your town, 
uh, this is Dateline Washington. Washington's gearing up for another uh, budget battle, mm -hmm. fiscal showdown, debt ceiling. Uh, walk us through what you think is going to happen now. Um, you know, liberal reporters spend an enormous amount of time saying that it's absolutely clear that there's gonna, the, the Republicans are going to shut down the government. I don't think that that's going to happen. Um, I, I sort of couldn't believe it was going to happen in 2011, but it was clear to me by three weeks out that indeed it was. Um, because Republicans had been elected in 2010, they were full of, you know, most of these people had been swept in by the Tea Party, um, and they were full of this sense that they were, you know, riding the crest of a wave of history. Um, as anyone who's been in Washington for more than two years knows, these waves actually tend to break pretty soon, um, but they didn't. They hadn't been in Washington that long. I don't see the same appetite now. You know, the base out there may want it, but the guys who are in Washington now are the guys who were there in 2011, and it did not go well for them. Uh, in part because what they wanted just wasn't achievable. You know, I, I would talk to them about the debt ceiling and say, well, you know, given how much money we're taking in right now, we could pay for Medicare and Social Security and veterans benefits and military payrolls um, and interest on the national debt, which is all the stuff that you guys said that you're going to pay for. But we couldn't pay for anything else. So are we going to strand the soldiers in Iraq? Just be like, hey, guys, war's over. Bye. <laughs> Hope you can get home OK. Are we going to shut down all the prisons? Are we going to pull the border guards off? Are they going to show up for work if they're not getting paid? You know, how is this going to work? Um, and they weren't realistic about it. They just had this kind of script in their head where it was all going to work out because they were so gung-ho. Um, they understand now that that didn't work so well and that it's not going to work again. Um, there is certainly appetite for taking a stand, but I, my personal opinion is I don't think they're actually going to dive off the cliff. I think mean, they're going to walk right up to the edge of the cliff and put on a really good show for their constituents. But I think at the last minute, they're going to come to a deal just because it, it got them nothing last time. And they all, you know, I, I, after 2012, when Obama was reelected for the first time, um, a Republican staffer just turned to me and was like, well, we lost. So we're going to have to get a little more realistic. And this is, I, I won't name names, this is a staffer for a pretty conservative Republican. This is not, you know, I mean, I guess the only one left in the, uh, there are not many liberal Republicans left in the, in the right. Congress. Uh, just a couple of other things, and we'll open it up to, uh, to questions. If you had, uh, if you were queen for a day, uh, which I know is the fantasy of, of queen or king for a day, the fantasy of most of journalists, fortunately, never uh, uh, comes true. I would spend most of it dressing up the crown jewel. <laughs> I tell you right now. After the dressing up, you would uh, do what? Two or three things to uh, un, uh, to to liberate the American economy. Um, well, one thing that I would really do is that I would I would radically overhaul um, entitlements to be much more focused on work, to be much more focused on. Um, yeah, I mean, the earned income tax credit is a great example of a program that has largely replaced things like the minimum wage, but also largely, you know, really been a supplement to welfare and a replacement for welfare and has worked beautifully at getting people back in and getting that connection and that contribution. Um, it hasn't, you know, welfare reform didn't do everything that we thought in terms of moving people kind of onto the job ladder, but it did actually, I think, really change family dynamics in, in what's ultimately a helpful way. Um, but more broadly, I think that it's actually, you know, in a sort of libertarian fusionist thing, it's actually easier to maintain support for programs if they're about reciprocity. You know, fundamentally, human beings are, were evolved to really believe strongly in reciprocity. Is that, and it's why Social Security and Medicare enjoy such huge support in this country, right? It's the feeling that you worked for it your whole life and now you get it. Um, and so, there are lots of, but I think that you look at things like Social Security Disability, which is just a trap. You go onto it and it's almost impossible to get off. It's incredibly risky to leave. Um, and, you know, we have more and more disability applications, even though the actual danger of our jobs and the actual physical component of our jobs is going down. Um, and, you know, I don't want to oversell this. It's people, it's not so much abusive as people just kind of, 
they're low skilled, they don't really know what else to do, there aren't a lot of jobs in their community and so they try to get on disability. And maybe you know, you're 40, your back hurts, you don't wanna stand behind a cash register all day. Um, but I would refocus these programs to be a lot more about work, to make it easier to get off programs and get onto work. Um, but also to make it easier, you know, public housing and these things, food stamps, I would tie them much more to a cash work benefit. So that's one thing that I actually think would be, I would extend the, the Social Security retirement age, I will dock if there are any retirees <laughs> in the room. Um, but I would do it, I, I, would, I would make it later, but I would make it later for people who are coming up. You need visibility, you need to be able to see things coming in advance. You can't just announce to someone at the age of, of 68 that you've decided that they need to go back to work because we made a mistake and their retirement age is now 70. <laughs> Um, so that's one thing. Um, more broadly, I would uh, radically overhaul the tax code. Um, not necessarily in a, in a progressive or conservative way, more in a Megan-esque way. Um, Megan-esque way. <laughs> I would, for example, I would eliminate this, the corporate income tax entirely, um, but I would also eliminate the special, ta the special preference for capital gains and dividends. I would tax all of those things as ordinary income once when they hit a person. You can't really tax a corporation. You know, GE does not have a flat, an 80 inch flat panel that was pl planning to buy <laughs> until you took it. You're taxing people. And it seems kind of silly to me to be taxing a little lady in Dubuque who owns 20 shares of AT&T at the same level as you tax Warren Buffett. But that's what we do right now. Because first the corporation pays the corporate income tax and then uh, you, know, you have to pay that 20% that capital gains on top of it. So I would change that so that if you are Paris Hilton, you pay a lot of money on your capital gains, and if you are a strain, you know, a, l a little retiree at Dubuque, you pay a lot less. Um, but you know, the main reason to do this is actually that if you look at the amount of activity that is spent avoiding the corporate income tax and arguing about the corporate income tax and having IRS people, the IRS literally has kind of branch offices at basically every major corporation in this country. And all they do is just sit around and, com and like argue about what the taxes are gonna be. And this is a phenomenal waste of human effort. Corporations have a lot of ways to evade taxes. It just seems easier to me to tax it, to levy the tax on people who are fairly easy to tax. Um, they can't really just decide to you know, have half of their activity happen in Japan um, and keep the money there. So. I would get rid of all of this evasive activity, all of these arguments about whether we're gonna repatriate foreign earnings or what have you, and I would just say, you know what? When you're a US citizen and you earn income, we tax that income, and when you're a corporation, we don't. Um, but I would do a bunch of other things in terms of getting rid of most deductions. Again, because the activity that is spent structuring your money to get around the deductions is just a waste. Um, and then, you know, the third thing that I would do um, is that I would, I would look really hard at government regulation. And here's how I think about this, is that if you've ever met someone, this is gonna be a, a somewhat long and winding story for which I apologize, but there is a, a point to this. Have you ever talked to people who've gotten themselves in really bad financial trouble? And this is one of my jobs, since I write about consumer finance. There's this interesting phenomenon, which is that they ask themselves whether they can afford something, and usually they can. Can I afford this new pair of shoes? Can I afford an 80-inch flat panel? Can I afford to move to Kansas? Um, and that and latter question, always yes. But uh, <laughs> the problem is they can't afford to do all of it, <laughs> right? Each individual item is fine, but when you add it all up, it's more than they make, and that's how they get themselves into trouble. And kind of similarly with regulation, we ask ourselves individually, is this regulation a good idea? It may be a fine idea, but here's the thing. If you're a small business, I don't know if there are any small business owners in, in this, uh, this room, but I talk to a lot of them. And if you own a, a small or medium-sized business, there's so many regulations. I talked to a guy, smart guy, uh, a economics PhD, like had, had some chops in policy, basically closed his business because he just realized he couldn't tell whether he was in compliance with New York regu uh, labor regulations. Right. Um, it's impossible to know because the complexity is so high now that unless you can afford to have a fleet of experts who will spend all of their time arguing with the branch office of the regulator at their, uh, <laughs> you can't know. And it's so complicated. And the example I go back to is my grandfather who during urban renewal was forced to move his gas station because some experts thought it would be better on the other side of the road. Um, they completely destroyed my mother's town, but that's another story. <laughs> but then, 
10 years later, it turned out there were old oil tanks. And if anyone knows anything about what happens when the EPA finds old oil tanks, you have to spend approximately 90 times whatever your income is remediating the old oil tanks. And he had no choice. He had to pay $100,000, which was a lot of money to him, to remediate the old oil tanks that were in the ground. Maybe it was more. I don't know what the amount was. Um, certainly in the six figures. Is it, and you know, maybe urban renewal was a good idea. The EPA regulations, I'm in favor of not having poisons leak into the ground. But you need a budget. You need like a regulatory budget where you say there's this much complexity because each one you add not only makes it harder for people to comply, but it actually to know because there's so much of it. But it can also actually become impossible to comply where there's so many regulations from different agencies and they overlap in ways that it's no longer even theoretically possible to be in compliance. Um, and the amount of time that you spend, you know, the first 10 are great, but by the time you've reached 20,000, you know, you could, you, you, a person literally could not spend enough time to know. And so you have to trust experts who may give you wrong advice and then you're in trouble for something that you couldn't do. That's all phenomenally problematic. And so I would set a regulatory budget for regulators. If you want to repeal this, if you want to pass this one, repeal something else and actually pare it down and say, look, it isn't that we shouldn't have good regulations. It's that there's a limit on how many regulations a society can usefully process, and we are beyond that limit. And so let's figure out which ones we really need, and let's just figure out which ones are kind of nice, but more costly in terms of complexity than they're worth. Good. One last one from me, and then uh, do we have microphones for questions? How are we going to do questions? This, this mic? Okay. Yeah. So... Um, about the blogging life, uh, bloggers are famously uh, uh, portrayed as sitting in their basements in their pajamas spouting off. Can you talk a little bit about how you work? Um, well, I don't work in our basement because it's unfinished and somewhat dusty. Uh, I do work on our couch um, a fair amount, and I, I do occasionally wear my pajamas to do it. Um, <laughs> Uh, it, it's always the UPS guy used to show up at our door every day, and then they replaced him with this incredibly young, cute UPS guy. And then I sort of made my husband start going to the door because I thought, <laughs> here I am, middle-aged housewife showing up at the door in her bathrobe, <laughs> <laughs> one in the afternoon. Um, but you know, so my work day it varies with each employer a little bit. But here's how it works at Bloomberg: um, I wake up uh, usually between six and six thirty. I let the dog out. Um, I sit down on the couch. I open my laptop and I start reading. And I have my, uh, it's called an RSS reader, which collects links from about 100 sources. And then I have some sources that aren't in my RSS reader for one reason or another. Um, so I cycle through the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, et cetera, um, and through a bunch of blogs that I read. And I, I do, that takes me about an hour and a half. Uh, by 8.30, I'm ready to email my editor and say, these are the three to four topics that I'm thinking of writing about today. Um, on that list is usually the one that I'm going to do immediately, and then the ones that I'll get to, depending on how much time it takes. And then I start writing. I try to get the first piece in, hopefully by 10, definitely by 11. Um, and then, um, you know, news may break. I keep the television on. Uh, I keep like a, you know Fox News or MSNBC or CNN on. So I'm really good. If you need any advice about investing in gold, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> all the commercials. Um, and you know then I, I finish up somewhere between uh, six and seven. Wow.